Today I'm reading from Ephesians 5, verses uh, 15 through 20. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to the God, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, church. My name is Emily Simons. I'm the women's and community pastor here at the square, and it is my honor and privilege to be with you this morning. Um, If you woke up craving a popsicle this morning um, as your post-breakfast treat, I just want to thank you in advance for taking advantage of that. Um, If you had seen the video, you would have heard a plug for um, our counterculture fundraiser where we are going to send kids in our community to camp. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I need to get out of my normal everyday routine and hear different voices in a different place to clearly discern what the Lord is saying to me. And so we want to give our students that opportunity and are grateful for your help in making that happen. Giving baskets are being passed right now. That's normally a part of the other section if you're visiting here today. We're just going with the flow. Uh, One of my favorite things. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) It's fine. It's fine. This is is what you need to know about me. We're we're just going to go for it. Okay, guys? Um, When I graduated from college and started my professional career, I... uh, ended up taking a bunch of assessments. I was trying to figure out like, what is it that I bring to the table? What kind of team member am I? What, uh, what is my personality? How does it interact with other people? And so um, I, got, I was trying to gather as much feedback as possible. And in these assessments, one of the uh, common themes that I would get back was that uh, something along, of, along the lines of, you are a deep thinker. You really like to think. You love ideas. Um, Not necessarily the fastest decision maker in the world, but you really like to think deeply about things. And uh, and so I, my first thought when I heard that was, doesn't everybody? (laughs) I thought that's what it meant to have a brain. Like you just liked being up there and thinking about things. And then I learned, you know, naive young person that I was, that's not a universal shared human experience. Um, People are made differently. And that is a unique part of how the Lord built me, but it is not how everyone operates. Um, Add on top of that, the fact that if you put all of humanity on a spectrum, which if you were at women's retreat, you already heard me say this once before, but if, if you put all of humanity on a spectrum and over here is laid back, easy breezy, go with the flow, pretty, you know, totally fine that nothing is going according to plan because it's all going to work out, you know, on this end and on this end, super intense type A, go, go, go. Nothing is good enough. It will always be better. So therefore we have to work harder. Like if, if that's the spectrum that we all fall on somewhere, then I tend to be like here <laughs> on that spectrum. So that means that today I am a super intense, deep thinking pastor, which means I am great at parties. <laughs> Super good at small talk. You know, that's totally my strength. Not at all, okay? Not at all. This is not my thing. Um, but if you want to know how what I think about something, I probably always have an answer. <laughs> and I tell you all of this because uh, I want to invite you to think about the way that you think this morning. Not a normal way to start a sermon, <laughs> but very in a line 
with who I am and what I bring to the table. So specifically, I want to ask you, what do you think about time? What comes to mind when I say time? How do you feel about it? And while I wish I could let you just go down that rabbit hole and think all your thoughts like I would like to do, uh, we don't have time for that. (laughs) But I wanted to at least give you a moment to just center yourself on where you might be. Maybe your first thought was, don't have enough of it. We have phrases in our culture, so much to do, so little time. Oh, I didn't have time. I ran out of time. These are the things that we're constantly thinking and saying, how are you? Busy, right? Or maybe you are a brass tacks kind of person and you're like, what is there to think? It is a neutral reality of life. (laughs) That is how it goes. I don't, I have no opinions. It just is. Or maybe you probably didn't have time to get there, but I would, I would present the idea that we all treat time as a currency. That we wake up in the morning and we have a full account, a time account. And then we trade it, we spend it on different things. So we need money. So we trade some of our time at our job to get money. We want entertainment, so we give some of our hours to Netflix and then receive entertainment in response. Or maybe we want a healthier body, so we give some of our minutes in the day to exercise or to cooking a meal. Until at the end of the day, our account is empty because we have literally spent it all. This is how we interact with time. Have you ever thought about what happens in the natural as time goes by? For example, especially if you don't do anything, if just the only thing that's happening is time passing, what happens when you don't brush your teeth? You're like, I can feel it right now. Makes me want to brush my teeth right now, just thinking about it. Or what happens to your floor if you don't sweep or vacuum for a while? What happens to your front yard if you don't mow the grass? Slightly less natural example, what happens to your car if you never change the oil? What happens to your garden if you never tend to it or pull weeds? So I want to go to the first two verses of our time of of our text today. Ephesians 5:15 and 16. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. And as I prepared for this sermon, that phrase because the days are evil just like I couldn't shake it. I kept thinking about it. I was like, what does that even mean? And do I believe it? I mean, I believe the Bible. It's in the Bible. Therefore, I believe that it's true. But do I have a worldview? Is the way that I think about time in alignment with this truth from the scripture? I wasn't sure. And then it sent me on this journey and thinking about the skin around my eyes and my mouth as time passes and the bananas on my counter when, yet again, none of us eat them. (laughs) We view time as a currency, but the scriptures, the Apostle Paul is giving us a different idea, which is time as a current, as in the movement of water in a river. It has momentum, it has direction, It has a destination. It's going somewhere. And as we think about time, as we experience it in this broken state, this broken world, 
The direction of time is decay, chaos, and the destination is death. And now you're thinking, Emily, this is the most depressing beginning to a sermon I've ever heard. Where are you going to go from here? Well, the Apostle Paul is like, well, that is why we have to pay attention. If you are going to be wise, we need to be careful. Uh, this is not like when I yell at my kids because they're climbing too high in a tree and it's freaking me out. Like, be careful. Have a little bit of fear, please. <laughs> He's saying, no, be full of care. Live intentionally. Live life on purpose. Psalm 90, 12, yes, Psalm 90, 12 says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. There is something about realizing that we have a limited amount of time that is directly tied to making the most of it. And so while it's uh, a little bit affronting to have someone stand up and be like, guess what? Time is passing. It's leading to decay and death. What we think about time matters because it impacts how we spend it. And if we want to be people who make the most of the time, then we need to be confronted with that reality and then adjust what we're doing. Paul has some specific recommendations on how to make the most of your time. And we're not going to get fancy. We're just going to go verse by verse as we talk about what he's pointing out. But this is where I want to pause. And if you are a part of the square, then remind you, or if you are a guest, then to fill you in that we are in the middle of a series through the entire letter of uh, the letter to the Ephesians. And that's important because this letter was written to a group of new believers who um, were trying to figure out what it was like to live real life in Ephesus, which is a Roman city, very much dictated by Roman culture, Roman rules, Roman expectations. So that meant that what they ate, how they bathed, how they worshiped, where they worked, how they worked, All of those things were dictated by the Roman religious system and Roman rule. But then they became believers, followers of Jesus, and they're like, wait a second. How do I live as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, instead of a Roman? Because not all those things line up. So what am I supposed to do but not supposed to do? So Paul, instead of directly just addressing all their very legitimate logistical concerns, he writes a book that gets divided into six chapters, but he spends the first three, the first full half of the book, talking to them about who they are, their identity, how much God loves them, how much he's equipped them with his spirit, how much of an inheritance they have, how much supernatural understanding he is giving them, how the dividing walls of humanity have come down and they have this unique unity in Jesus. He's telling them all these things, building them up, encouraging them for the first full half of his letter before he touches anything about what they should do or how they should act. And this is important because the scripture that I'm teaching from today is squarely in the uh, what to do and how to act portion of the letter. But it would have never been received without being heard through the lens of all of that identity. And so I don't have time to go back and cover all of that for us today, but you should listen to the rest of the series. It's really great. Um, and I need you to hear every word of what comes next through the lens of being reminded how loved, how valued, how pursued by God you are and how much he is pouring himself out to you. And then out of response to that is what we do and how we act. And maybe you are here today and you are not a follower of Jesus. Uh, You haven't given your life to God. I'm so glad you're here. 
And I just want you to know that this is a family conversation. This is uh, a believer talking to other believers about how to navigate the tensions between their everyday life and their life of faith. And it's not a level of expectation or judgment on you or anyone else. And you just get to listen in. Sound good? Okay. Here we go. All right. Verse 17. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. If I were going to paraphrase this in my own words, I might say something like, pay attention. God is up to something. Go find out what it is. Do you know one of my favorite characteristics of God? I mean, he's God, so he's amazing and wonderful in every way that he exists. But one of my favorite things is that he's a planner. <laughs> I can prove it. He had it all written down so that you could study it, so that you could learn about it, so that you could discern what the will of the Lord is. He gave you his spirit so you could pray, so you can learn about the plan. From the very beginning, when human beings messed everything up, he was like, okay, well, here's how I'm going to fix that. And it's going to take a while. But there's a point where the direction will no longer be decay. The destination will no longer be death. But all things will be made new. That eternity will stretch on forever in light of the goodness of God. But there's a plan. And we're kind of in the middle of it. Getting from point A to point B. And the insane thing is, he lets us be a part of it. I was uh, cooking dinner the other day. And it involved chopping a lot of vegetables that night. So I'm in the kitchen, and my three-year-old daughter comes up and goes, Mommy, me cook too? And I was like, okay, here we go. <laughs> so <laughs> I picked her up, picked her up <clears throat> put her on the counter, and while giving her a knife is not really a wise choice at this stage of her age and development, I gave her a bowl and I said, okay, I'm going to chop all the vegetables. You pick them up and you put them in the bowl. And she was pumped. So she takes a chubby little fist and she picks up, you know, like seven pieces of diced onion and then moves it over to the bowl and like drops half of them on the way uh, and puts them in the bowl. And... She has at it. She's having so much fun because she is cooking, you know. Now, did she drop some pieces on the floor wasting it? Yeah. Was it probably um, less sanitary to have my three-year-old touch every piece of food that we were <laughs> going to eat? Yes. Hopefully the oven burned everything off. It's fine. We wash our hands. It's fine. Would it have been more efficient if I had just picked up my cutting board and put it all in the bowl at once? Yeah. But was my daughter learning something along the way? Yeah. Was our relationship being built up in that moment as she helped me cook? Yeah. Did I love having my daughter with me in that moment? Yes. And this is the kind of heavenly father that we have. He lets us be a part of his plan. But we have to know what it is to be able to get in alignment with it. We have to recognize what he's doing to go ask if we can be a part of it. And so this is the invitation. You want to make the most of your time? Find out what the will of the Lord is. Align yourself with it and participate in it. Are you going to mess up? Yeah. Is it going to get messy along the way? Sure. But the Lord rejoices in your participation. He rejoices in your participation. Make the most of your time. Verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery but be filled with the spirit. 
you guys didn't get to see the video, but Pastor Phil is in Brazil right now. And so if you're wondering if he assigned me this passage and then left the country, yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> But that's okay. We're just going to go for it, you guys, because there is no nuanced understanding of ancient Greek, which changes the meaning of this verse. It says what you think it says. And here's the thing. Paul, as he is helping believers, as he is helping us to know how to make the most of the time, he is addressing what we fill ourselves with. Because every human being has an internal space. And when it is empty, it is terrifying. It feels cavernous and like it's all wrong because, it's, because it is, because we weren't designed for that space in us to be empty. So we spend a lot of time and a lot of energy trying to fill it up, at least temporarily, or numbing ourselves at least to the awareness of its emptiness, right? But we have to see that we actually have a lot of options. Maybe in the ancient world, alcohol was the most readily available, the easiest access, but we have a lot of drugs. We have shopping. We have online doom scrolling. We have working 80 hours a week trying to find meaning and purpose and just not look too much at that empty space in our chests. And we have to see that Paul poses getting drunk, this filling of ourselves as the opposite of being filled with the Spirit. Now, I know even within the church, there is a wide range of opinions on how to handle this, right? Forget the outside world. Just within the church, there are those who are like, uh, don't walk down that aisle in the grocery store. Don't be around it. Don't smell it. Don't touch it. Don't drink it. Okay? No alcohol. Or maybe there's the other end of the spectrum that's like, Jesus made wine for the wedding at Cana. He drank wine. I can drink wine. It's fine. I'm free. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus is not in support of religious legalism or in an enabling you to do whatever you want. This is not a judgment, but it is an invitation because it's not, um, yeah, it's not a condemnation and it's not a ancient version of please drink responsibly. There is a line in consuming alcohol when once you cross it, you are no longer able to operate in spiritual authority. And you can no longer be the representative uh, presence of Jesus to the people around you. So church, do not get drunk. Have I mentioned I'm great at parties? <laughs> oh, man. It's fine. It's fine. Now, if alcohol is a significant part of your life, either in the past or in the present, or there is something else that you are trying to fill yourself with, do not hear me say anything other than you are not alone. It is not because you are inherently broken as an individual that you feel that way. That is a shared common human experience that we have that space that we don't know what to do with and that is uncomfortable, but there is hope. There is hope. Paul says, be filled with the spirit. And this is the thing that we have access to, that we get to choose. And when the spirit fills us, then we are filled with power that is not our own. And we become a well, not empty, but overflowing. A spring of living water to the thirsty people around us. We get to overflow things like 
love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. Not because we've figured it out, not because we're better than anyone else, not because we're smarter or more capable, but because the spirit is within us. And those are the things that the spirit brings. So even in the midst of the circumstances of your life, when we are filled with the spirit, they're not any less complicated or painful or hard. We are still in that broken river of time experiencing decay and death, but we can live as though we know and we have access to what is coming in the full. The spirit is in us. We have access to the spirit. Therefore, we can make the most of our time. We can make the most of our time. You might be wondering how, how do you, how are you filled with the spirit? The Bible shows us through the laying on of hands and prayer. We have prayer teams every Sunday. We have pastors that would love to meet with you and pray over you during the week. Ask and you shall receive. We believe that the Lord pours his spirit out over his people to equip them. And if you have not experienced that, we would love to walk with you in it. There is hope. There is goodness in the spirit of God. We don't have to do this on our own. Verse 19, as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, that's a lot of synonyms. Why three words that mean the same thing, right? Always ask the Bible your questions. You find out the most interesting things because it's all in there on purpose. Psalms are the Jewish word for worship, as in the book of Psalms. These are the songs that they sang to God. Hymns is the Greek word for worship. It's the same word that you would find in uh, Homer's Iliad, talking about singing a song in praise of a Greek God. So we've got the Jewish word, the, gen the Gentile word, and then there's spiritual songs. This is only mentioned, this word only exists two other times in the Bible. Once in the book to the Colossians, when Paul is using the same list, says Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, same time sharing the similar idea. And then the other is in Revelation. When it's describing the new song of new creation in the throne room in praise of Jesus that all of creation unified together makes together. So you want to make the most of your time? You got to worship God with people who don't look like you, who are not the same as you. You get to participate in a community of believers that rub off your rough edges because there's friction. <laughs> we get to make the most of our time by developing this community. And not only that, it doesn't stop there, but it keeps going, right? It's among yourselves, but then singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts. There's a communal aspect to worship, but then there's also the individual aspect. Because you can't follow Jesus on your own. It's not enough. You have to be around other people. But not only that, you also can't just surround yourself with people who love God and have that be enough. You want to make the most of your time? You develop an act of worship between you and the Lord. You spend time with God. You're not gonna magically have more minutes in that account to spend time with God. You have to intentionally spend them on him. And it's this communal aspect, this individual invitation, both and where we make the most of our time by worshiping God and being aware of him. Verse 20 giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gratitude. I'm so grateful that we spent some time talking about it. I don't get to talk about it right now, but we experienced it. It was in the room. It is important. 
But what I want to focus on is the at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you guys remember studying Greek or Roman mythology? Maybe in middle school, maybe high school. Do you remember all the drama that was involved? <laughs> Like somebody was always mad at somebody else. They're all really selfish. They're all in a war. The only time they really care about humans if one of them is particularly beautiful. I mean, it was a mess. It was a mess. But here's the thing. They all had different niches, things that they were in charge of, uh, things that they had power over. And when you were worshiping as a Roman citizen, you would pick allegiance to a one or two gods and you would offer sacrifices, bring worship to the temple in the hopes of building up your account, building up the brownie points where this God was going to like you, that you had like paid enough homage that you had earned their favor so that in the worst case scenario, when you needed them to intervene on your behalf, then they would be disposed to help you. And the way that you called upon a Greek God, the way that you got asked them to intervene on your behalf is by calling upon their name. And so as a Christian, I just grew up saying in Jesus' name as like the signifier that you were about to stop praying, <laughs> right? It just was in there. Now there's, it's biblical, there's reasons why we end our prayer that way, but mostly we totally miss how radical this invitation is because they were saving up their saving up their asks for only when they really needed it and only after they had put in enough worship to uh, maybe hope or to presume that this God would be disposed to help them. And instead, we have a God that he says, at all times, in everything, we do it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to make the most of your time? Ask Jesus to be in it with you. Call upon his name. Get his help, his presence, his uh, witness with you. It's radical. It's not just available in the worst case scenario. It's not just available if you've been good enough. It's just available because he loves you. And so if you're examining data in an Excel spreadsheet, do it in Jesus' name. <laughs> you have access to him. If you're going to carpool, in carpool line, do it in Jesus' name. You want to make the most of your time, bring Jesus with you. He doesn't come when he's not asked. You get to invite him by calling on his name. Make the most of your time. Matt, you can come on up. I'm gonna close this out. I have one more story for you. When my husband, Sean, and I were newly married, we had been in Atlanta only, only a little while, we got to help um, facilitate something called the Georgia Student Leadership Forum. And it was basically a weekend uh, conference where College students who were in leadership roles in their um, schools were invited from all over the state to come and learn about leadership, specifically servant leadership. And part of the weekend was um, doing a group service project at City of Refuge in Atlanta. An amazing organization that meets all sorts of needs for all sorts of people. But we had this group, Sean and I had a small group um, that we were kind of walking through the weekend with. We got to um, you know, debrief after every speaker and kind of talk about all the things that were going on in the weekend. And uh, they, we weren't all together for the service project. So uh, we were all doing different things and we were debriefing at the end of the night and we were asking, you know, what did you do at City of Refu Refuge? How did it go? And this one guy and this one girl, I wish I remembered their names, I don't. But this one guy 
Um, he was like, we were uh, doing like assembly line. We were packing boxes full of food to take to families that need it. And it was great. We made like X amount of boxes, but this girl over here, she was, she was on fire. She filled like three times as many boxes as anyone else. She was getting after it. And he was, you know, telling the story of the day, but he was also giving her a compliment and just, you know, we're talking. Um, but she just so gently, so kindly responded and said, yeah, when I was a kid, there was a year where we didn't have any food and those boxes were given to us and it was all that we had. And I just wanted to make as many as possible for the kids who are like me. And this young woman was making the most of her time because she knew what was on the other side. She knew what was at stake. What she did with that opportunity mattered, not for her, but for someone else. Church, we have to stop seeing instructions in the Bible, commandments as this, you know, weird uh, requirement of us where we're in friend, our individual rights are limited and infringed upon. Because it's not about us. There are people out there, they know, they can feel it in their bones. There is decay and death coming and they don't know that there's a plan to make all things new they don't know there's a God that loves them that has good things in his heart towards them that he wants to rescue them and how are they gonna know unless someone studies the plan figures out what God is doing and then aligns with it and then tells the people that they get run into when they do that hey did you know there's a plan I know this is hard, but there are good things God has. He has healing and fulfillment and restoration. It's, it's his plan. And there are people with gaping sized holes in their souls and they are trying to fill it with everything they can possibly think of so they don't have to feel that way anymore. And what we need is people who have had that space filled with the Spirit go and tell them, you don't have to live like this anymore. I know you have a hole, but there's something that can fill it permanently and fully to the point of overflowing. And guys, I don't know if you've looked out there recently, but it's pretty divided. How are people gonna know that the dividing walls of humanity have been brought crashing down in Jesus Christ unless there is a church that is full of every person, of every skin color, every socioeconomic status, every education level, treating each other with love and honor and respect. Those walls rubble under our feet. And how are they gonna know that God isn't like Santa Claus, only available at the worst case scenario, or if you've been good enough, that he actually is available 24 seven, no matter what and everything at all times, unless we have people who believe it and access it and then tell the stories of God's faithfulness when he shows up again and again and again. We have to make the most of our time. There's something at stake. It's not about us. We get to love other people by making the most of our time.
we get to love other people. So church, if you're like, I need help, I need access to that spirit, please come and get prayer. Please set a meeting with the pastor. We would love to meet with you. And if you are here today and maybe, maybe you grew up in the church, but then adulthood came and it was busy and it wasn't a priority anymore, but you're back because you're curious. Maybe you have adult-sized problems and adult-sized questions and only a memory of a childlike faith. Or maybe everything I'm saying is totally strange to you and you're not sure what I'm talking about. We have something called Alpha starting in three days. It's a group. We'll meet on Wednesday nights for several weeks. You'll get dinner and then you will have space and conversation to raise up every question, every yeah, but that you can think of. Sunday mornings, we don't get a lot of back and forth. It's one of the bummers but we are making this space specifically for you to be able to come, to learn, to ask questions, to discern on your own, at your own pace. But we're here to tell you, God loves you. There's place for you here. And we wanna be a people surrounding you that live our lives on purpose, not for our benefit, not making the most of the time for ourselves, but for you so that you know how radically loved you are by God. So I would love it if you would be brave, sign up. You can find out more at the table right out the doors when you leave, or you can go to the website and it's all there. But Wednesday starts this week. We would love to have you. Church, would you stand? I would love to pray for you and bless you and send you on your way. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every one of these people that you have brought here today. And I thank you that you have a plan, that you're not going to leave us where we are right now, but you will restore. That the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Thank you, God, that we will not be stuck in this time forever but that we will be with you where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves cannot break and steal, break in and steal. But help us to live now like we know what is coming. Help us to respond to the love and the identity that you have bestowed upon us with joy, making the most of our time. Help us, God, we can't do this on our own. It is only by your spirit. We need you, God. We love you, God. And we ask and say all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, may God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he turn his countenance to you. And may you know everywhere you go this week that you are radically loved by God. If we can pray, let us pray, but have the great rest of your day.